I was three years old. I was at my grandmother's house. I remember walking across the cold tile floor with my bare feet jolted as I walked to the bedroom. I woke up a few hours later with my first conscious memory. It ended up being the equivalent of a night terror, but it was something otherworldly. I felt like everything had fallen away. It was just me and nothingness. There was no sound, no smell, no physical sensations on my skin. This moment introduced me to the insignificance that I felt in the world. It introduced me to the sense of the nothingness that surrounded me. My mother used to say I had Narfentrubel, a low German statement that means nervous problems. In this area, I grew up in northern Mexico in a small community. It was a religious community that was disconnected from everything that I experience in life today. Any worldly possessions were essentially forbidden. We didn't have electricity, we didn't have vehicles, we didn't have running water. Our evening conversations were often held through the gentle augmentation of a flickering oil lamp while we discuss the days of the world and the things of the world. Our education system consisted of going to school until about grade three, which was typically enough time for you to learn how to read the Bible and to do rudimentary math to keep your farm finances in order. In this space, the only thing that mattered was knowledge from God. While the formal education of this community was low, I was in a community deeply embedded with intelligences. I felt that intelligence when cattle would seek protection well before a thunderstorm came through. I could see that intelligence when the pigs and the chickens would scamper and scurry at our first movements that we might be coming around for the morning feed. I could also feel as a young child, not able to give words to it yet, but that intelligence and connection as my parents wept extended periods of drought where crops would die and birds would die and I could feel their humanity and the intelligence that existed outside of what I define as education today. To the religious mind, these experiences were essentially the equivalent of God providing for us. The good, the bad was a provision from God. At minimum though, I was in a space and in a community where everything I did was entangled with nature. It wasn't George alone. It was me as part of a community, as part of nature, as part of the wildlife around us. When I was six years old, my family moved to Canada, a move about 2,500 miles north and what felt like 200 years into the future. I started my first formal education. My mother had made a promise to her mother that she wouldn't allow us to go to school because if we went to school we would lose some of that humility that we needed that was a defining trait of our faith. I hated school but at age nine I remember explicitly challenging her and saying if you don't let me go to school I'll report you to authorities. <laughs> Not because I wanted school but because I wanted the opportunity to feel connected to the bigger community around me. As any immigrant family does, we worked. When school was done from 4 or 4.30 on, I and my family, there was a big family, six of us siblings in total, would clean a slaughterhouse for chickens. There was about 12,000 chickens that were processed a day. The mechanical process of life that I used to experience by feeding by hand only a few years prior. In this experience, though, I had opportunities to break out of that environment and go, go to a nearby library and read roughly any and all the books that I could possibly get my hands on. There was a quest for knowledge. And it wasn't knowledge because I wanted to know things. It was knowledge because I wanted to be connected to the people around me. I knew I was different as an immigrant child. I looked different. I dressed differently. My family kept the customs and the habits that they had when they had first moved to Canada. So I stuck out like a sore thumb. 
I didn't match and I was filled with shame. And it was my desire to try and learn to connect, to fit in, and to belong. Since that time, I've had a privileged career, being able to travel, being able to speak at conferences and venues. And in my academic career and as a researcher, I've been able to explore domains of data, analytics, psychology, increasingly artificial intelligence, but a really constant thread has been how do we create systems of learning that help our students, all of our students, become successful and live lives of promise and satisfaction and joy. So if you take a bit of a step back from that point, the earliest stage of humanity, when we first uttered words and decided to name things like fire or food or berries or enemy, and when we took those words and we put them into a physical form, in this case it could be a book or it could be a tablet or it could be a scroll, but when we took our words, put them into a physical form, we summoned AI. Why did we do that? Or in what way did we do that? Well, when you take an idea or a concept and you give it a physical form, thousands of years later, we're able to take that physical form, digitize it, and by digitizing it, make it available to everyone in the world, and by making it available to everyone in the world, to make it available to AI. Now, as this knowledge grew and grew, and there was greater quantity being made available, in 1500s, there was an interesting statement by a researcher that said there was a confusing and harmful abundance of ideas, right? We couldn't stay on top of it and we couldn't keep track of it. So we found new ways to store and manipulate it and manage it from libraries to classification systems such as Linnaean and Dewey. Uh, we had countries and regions and researchers from around the world contributing from uh, Quarizzi's algebra to Kai Loon's invention of paper, we had a global humanity march toward the externalization of our knowledge in a physical form so that it could eventually be rendered usable by AI. But in the process, we have now gone through generations of knowing and building and creating. But we're starting to be connected or disconnected from those systems. We're starting to disconnect from our humanity. James Bridle, an artist and author, describes there are ways of existing in the world what he calls as more than human knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that exists in areas that we're only now starting to understand. It exists in the ways that trees communicate with one another. There's vast mycelium networks under our feet wherever we are. They're communicating. There's intelligence there. It's not intelligence that we understand, but there's intelligence there. And all of these systems, from the murmurations of starlings that create stunningly beautiful patterns that we don't yet understand, to the ecosystems that occur when we introduce a wolf into Yellowstone National Park and suddenly we have a flourishing of wildlife from beavers to fish to birds that come in simply because we allowed nature to balance itself without our heavy human hand. And so these connected microsystems that exist are significant and they underpin our lives and we actually don't understand them and they're an intelligence type that is different from ours. We live, many of us, in a simulated reality today. We have simulated relationships. They're mediated through a screen. It's fantastic, but it's not without a cost. Our ability to game and with VR headsets and increasingly with Neuralink, we are more connected than ever before we are more globally aware than ever before. But this technology interface comes with a cost. We are also less healthy. We are less happy. We have more anxiety and we are more lonely and we are more distressed than we have ever been. So there is a cost to this simulated technology layer. When I was a child, in Mexico, for example, to go back to that experience. I had a direct relationship to everything around me. But when I got to Canada, and even now, I go to a grocery store, I have no relationship with what I purchase. The chicken breast that I take off the shelf, I just, it's a chicken breast. I didn't feed it, I didn't nurture it, I didn't recognize it sacrificed its life for me at dinner, even at a crude fundamental level. I'm disconnected, the clothes that I wear today, I don't know who made them. I'm removed from the products of the labor of others in a way that is actually dehumanizing. 
We've also had a loss of the ability to be bored. We measure and track everything. I can tell you exactly what my heart rate was before I stepped out this afternoon. We have the ability to track and understand more and more parts of ourselves uh, on a regular and ongoing basis. And so there's a worrying part with this data and the proliferation of data that is concerning. And this boredom that we have and that we don't give ourselves the boredom means we continue to add layers that distract us from the world around. And so what we emphasize in this space is an isolating layer through Zoom that doesn't allow us to sync up in heart rates the way that we do when we're together in a space. That doesn't allow the touch and the smell and the presence of people that makes it human for us. We've lost at some level the synchronization and the rhythmic vibrancy of humans just in play and in space physically together. It's so easy to get on a Zoom call. It's so easy to be connected and yet at the same account disconnected from the world around us. So at a fundamental level, we have lost a type of core connectedness. Humans though, right now, in spite of this human condition of disconnection, are confronted with an incredible period of change. We're on the cusp of a transition that we still don't understand. We, for example, cannot absorb enough of the information that we've created. There's a tremendous quantity that exists, but AI can. Artificial intelligence can outthink us in more and more areas of cognition. It can do the LSAT, it can do the MCAT, it can recognize cancer tissue and images more accurately than most human beings can. We can write, we can create images, we can even create movies with artificial intelligence. AI in this sense is godlike. It has taken over a part of who we are in a way that we never anticipated that it could or would, certainly not such a short period of time. And what it does then is it makes AI not something that we use as a tool, but a co-inhabitor with us. It occupies our cognitive space. It takes on more and more of what we do. It sees with almost godlike superiority how pieces of information connect around the world across trillions of pages of text, across billions of websites. And so in this regard, we're confronted with a challenge because we as humans have made our claim on this very narrow type of knowledge that AI is increasingly taking over for us. We are becoming a second class citizen in the type of knowledge that we've created. Put another way, AI is the first injection of intelligence on Earth since our neocortex came online. It's best seen, I think, as an entirely new species. My wife, a clinical psychologist, and I have spent quite a bit of time thinking about what the implications of this are. When AI takes over more and more, we become more and more disconnected. What's lost and what's gained and what are the consequences of that? How do we reintegrate humans back into spaces of connectedness? What does it mean for us to return to ourselves, to return to the things that vibrantly make us feel alive, that heal us, that make us feel responsible for our elders, that connect us to our children, that connect us and put us in a role of stewards of the planet that we exist on? And in so that regard, I think AI, simply because AI tells us blatantly, day in and day out, with every new research point, you guys aren't as significant as you thought you were. You guys don't matter as much as you think you did. And so AI then forces us to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, probably our only area of competition with AI is going to be in our core humanity. And so in this regard, AI can be a conduit back to connection. It can be an opportunity for us to bring that relationship that we've perhaps stepped away from. Because in the future, we are going to have AI in our pockets. You will have an AI buddy within the next few years that will be with you and observe and track and see everything you do. It'll be in your glasses. It'll be in your phones and in your watches. Your car will be a robot. You will, in the next few years, have a robot in your home that will help with rudimentary tasks. So the question becomes, what will we become in this space where AI is proliferate, where AI increasingly adopts more and more of the things that we do on a day in and day out basis? So here I am, 50 years removed from flickering oil lamps, wondering and pondering how to exist in a space that is growing at a level that is accelerating and almost incapable of being able to grasp and understand. 
And yet, I'm filled with a deep optimism, a deep sense that AI has the capability to help us right the broken systems that we've created, to help us care about the systems of care that are today broken. AI itself is not preordained. It's not going to come down for us in a form that someone has created. We will day in and day out by the decisions we make in our personal lives, the data collection that we accept from devices that we use, the regulations that we require from our leaders, from the decisions that we make in how and what we teach within our classrooms, that will shape AI. That's what's going to determine whether AI is something that will humanize us or whether it will increasingly dehumanize us. As humans, we're presented now with an opportunity that I don't think comes more than once every several millennia. Today, we're confronted with an opportunity to recreate and recenter human and planetary well being as the center and the explicit focus of everything that we do from our schools to our systems of care and to the way that we relate to one another. Thank you.